Hi, my name is Scott, and I have read all of the Harry Potter books multiple times. I've seen all of the movies, and like most of my peers, I continue to be a Harry Potter enthusiast to this day. And I'm Becky, and I have never read a Harry Potter book or seen any of the films, which makes me the ultimate muggle. Join us as we make our way through each book, section by section, where Becky will make predictions about what she thinks will happen next. And Scott will try to convince me why it's a good series worth reading and maybe even worth loving. Hi everyone, welcome to A Muggle's Guide to Hogwarts, where we are going to continue to explore the Harry Potter series with the ultimate muggle, someone who has never read the books or seen the movies and really has no intention to ever do so, except now I'm making them do it. Yeah, I can't say that anymore. I can't say I have never opened a Harry Potter book because this week I read the first three chapters. Of Harry Potter. I'm so sorry that I took that away from you. <laughs> I'm not a Harry Potter virgin anymore. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it feels a little strange. You can't act like you have no idea what's going on when people I talk can't. about Harry Potter. I can't. Man, Ugh. that must be hard for you. Well, welcome to the world that everyone else is living in. I'm <laughs> glad you're here. Uh, And today we are going to talk about the first three chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone uh, because Becky read those three chapters and so did I. And we're going to have a discussion about kind of what goes on. Becky has a lot of questions and a lot of notes and thoughts that she wants to get through. But we're also going to talk about what was right in her prediction, what was wrong in her prediction. Uh, And then at the end of this episode, Becky is going to make her prediction for the next three chapters of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, chapter four, five, and six. Yeah, I think maybe I'll do better on my predictions this time because I have a little bit more of like a base of knowledge and like how it might flow and some of the characters. Um, I, I feel like I was just way shots in the dark last time. You feel like you'll do better with your predictions? Because I don't know. I feel like the prediction for the first three chapters of the book, it was pretty good because like that is kind of well known. Like I feel like the start of the story is pretty well known. Sure. Well, we'll get into it. We'll get into it later. Yeah. Well, and this next section's a doozy. So we can talk about that. Okay. So I guess we should just start with talking about those three chapters overall. So the chapters that you predicted and read are The Boy Who Lived, The Vanishing Glass, and The Letters from No One. And for anyone listening that needs a little bit of a refresher, uh, that first section is when Harry arrives at the doorstep of the Dursleys, uh, and we learn a little bit about his life growing up in the cupboard under the stairs. They go to the zoo for Dudley's birthday, and uh, then he starts receiving letters, and uh, eventually they go to this isolated shack where Hagrid knocks down the door, and that's kind of where those first three chapters end, uh, is with Hagrid knocking down the door in the isolated shack. So what did you think? What are your first reactions and thoughts about the first three chapters? Yeah, my kind of initial reaction to the the section as a whole. Um, obviously, it's my first time reading this writing style, and I thought it was surprisingly clever and funny. I didn't expect to kind of like giggle and laugh as much as as I did. Um, and you know, because we read them out loud together um, because <laughs> yeah. we're dorks. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, I found them very humorous. Um, Can you tell me like a specific moment that you thought was very funny? Oh, I mean, the f- the funniest part to me that still is like tickling me is that Harry once got a coat hanger for a birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really funny. So that's that's like a recurring theme throughout the books. Coat hangers? It's not coat hangers, but really awful gifts from the Dursleys on his birthday. You'll, you'll, you'll see. There's some good ones, but they all follow that kind of similar. They're all 
coat hanger esque in quality. Oh you know? my gosh! Okay, well that that was really funny to me. Um, well, first of all, you lied to me a little bit. What did I do? What did I say? You said Harry Potter was a main character in all of the chapters, and he was not really even in the first chapter. So he's <laughs> okay. He's pretty important. I'm and sure he's he mentioned is. several times. He is, in the but first he doesn't chapter. actually show up until the very end. So the first chapter is just about the Dursleys and just setting up this awful, miserable world that they live in. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, to contrast with the magical world we're supposed to be inspired by. Um, so, yeah, so I feel like the first chapter was a lot about getting to know the Dursleys, um, which I thought they had really funny descriptions. I liked how their kind of their um, physical description matched some kind of personality trait around them. Like in particular, like Mrs. Dursley with her long neck so she could see over into the neighbors. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like she's like a, you know, a nosy Nancy. But then she talked about the long neck and I was like, oh, that's that's funny. I like that. It is one of those funny things because we're reading this, what, 20 something years later that like it's one of those things that people are like pointing out now. It's like, why were there so many fat jokes in the 80s and 90s. Like, why was that an okay thing? Mm -hmm. So I think there's some of that lingering in the Dursley's descriptions. I mean, I don't really know how I feel about that necessarily, but it it seems out of place now to just be like, and he was fat, you know? Yeah. There were some other funny descriptions that stood out to me. One of them was for Mr. Dursley. Um, I definitely giggled when it said he went to his closet and picked out his most boring tie. I mean, like that in and of itself to me is like pretty funny, not just because I like work in clothing and costume design, but it's like, it doesn't say he just picked out a boring tie. Mm -hmm. It says he picked out his most boring tie, which is just hilarious and I could just like visualize like a row of ties that are all terribly boring and him trying to sort through to find the one that is the most boring. Right. <laughs> well, he has, to, he has to go to his boring job at the like drill, drill factory, factory? Yeah. <laughs> the drill firm. So the first chapter starts with them, it starts with the Dursleys and explores their life, uh, how it's very normal. And they live on this normal boring street. And then Mr. Dursley goes to his office, but he starts seeing weird things happening outside, right? He sees some people dressed in robes and he's like, what? That's insane. Why are people wearing robes about and uh, like colorful? Yeah, and he was green very concerned about what everyone else was wearing. And I was like, dude, like, let them let them be. They're just having a good time. You and know, even in his office. It's specifically mentioned that the, his chair does not face the window, so he can't look outside. He what faces a sad the boring. Man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I think that's the whole point. Okay, so I have a question. Okay. So is this story taking place on Earth? Is it taking place on Earth? Like literally on Earth? <laughs> I guess I'm like, I'm not even quite sure what I mean, but there are some like, is it supposed to be like, this is Earth and there's this magical realm that we just can't access as normal people? Or is this a kind of alternate reality where this magic and this non-magic coexist? So you're going to learn more about this literally in the next section. But I'll just say, yes, this is taking place on Earth, on the Earth that you know. This isn't like some alternate universe or anything. This is taking place on the earth that you know, and all of the wizards and the magic element to it is kind of hidden from these muggles. So then whenever he's seeing all these people in robes and things and it stands out and he, you know, is bothered by it. I don't know. He also talks about them like disappearing. He does. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. Like yeah, he'll he turn might. back around and they'll mm-hmm. be gone. And so I'm just like, what? Like, how does how does this magic world and this non-magic world interact and how do they coexist? 
Well, you'll learn more about that, and you'll also learn a little bit more about the magic itself that wizards and witches possess and are able to do. Um, and I think that just adds to the magical element. Like, he is looking around, expecting a normal drive to work, and then all of a sudden he sees these weird people out, um, and when he looks to go, turns to look again, they're not there. And that also kind of adds to the mystical, magical uh, mystery of it all. Hmm. I don't I say don't overthink that too much um, and just in, as you go into these next three chapters you'll definitely learn a little bit about how the magic world is goes along parallel to the the muggle world and how it's hidden a little bit from view okay yeah okay so kind of along with that we we did meet some magical people as well not just the mm-hmm. muggle family right there uh, were a couple of magic yes, that were we people that you the, think are magic. Right. The cat who is Minerva McGonagall. Yes. And we met Dumbledore. And I just have to say that section where like the two of them are talking, I think I was reading aloud at that point, and they say each other's names in every <laughs> single sentence. And it got really hard to continue to say McGonagall and Dumbledore over and over and over again. I think titles, I, I, this is like an English book. It's a British book. And I think maybe titles in a school like this are more important. I don't know that. I'm just making that up. But yeah, that's a good observation that they say their names a lot. Throughout the stories, uh, you'll, there's even an attempt by students to not say like full titles of professors. Uh, and that's quickly corrected. So, okay. I think it's a kind of a respect thing and maybe it's kind of built into like British culture, but I don't actually know that. Yeah. I, I don't know either. And maybe it was just those two characters because they have difficult names, but I didn't notice it when they were talking about other people, they would use pro, you know, pronouns, he, she, they, but this one was all just like, yeah. McGonagall, McGonagall, McGonagall. What do you think about those two characters, Albus Dumbledore and Minerva McGonagall? Um, I didn't really have a lot of feelings about them. Um, McGonagall seemed kind of uptight, mm-hmm. uh, which I think Dumbledore mentioned, like, why weren't you out partying? Why are you just sitting on this wall all day? Um, and Dumbledore seemed nice enough i liked his like the kind of like humor of him trying to pull everything out of his cloak and his beard getting in the way and minerva thinking he was maybe going to pull out baby harry potter at one point i thought that was kind of like clever and funny Mm -hmm. um but i didn't really have a lot of feelings about their characters yet except like i just feel like it's such a terrible place to leave a baby. And why would they do that to him? Like, I know that they kind of explained it, but like, there was no other alternative. What what was their, what was their explanation for leaving Harry? That no one would look for him there. Mm. Even though he's related to them. So I'm sure everyone listening probably knows this, but so Harry's parents are killed and you actually predicted that. Yeah, that's fairly obvious. Harry's parents are killed in in an attack by, a dark wizard. Yeah. Um called do they say his name? They this? do, yeah. Because there's a whole big lead up to it because she's like, you know who, you know who, you know who, and then Dumbledore's just like, Oh, just say it or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they say the name Voldemort. Yeah. And uh it's known that Harry's parents are killed by Voldemort and Harry somehow survived, but we don't know how. Mm-hmm. And so they go and retrieve Harry and Dumbledore thinks they should leave Harry at the Dursleys, which are his aunt and uncle. So not actually. Yeah, not foster parents yeah. like I thought. They're actually related. Right. Um, which is interesting because Harry's a wizard. Mm-hmm. And the Dursleys are clearly not, right? Yeah, I did notice something really strange mm. or weird. So his parents' names were James and Lily, and his aunt's name is Petunia, who is Lily's sister. Yeah. 
So they're both named after flowers. That's all. That's a really good observation. <laughs> it's our, our petunias like not as cool as Lily. I have no idea, but I just am wondering about their family. Like, I don't know if this book will ever go like who were Petunia and Lily's parents. Were they magical or, or muggle or mixed or how did you get one of one and one of the other? Or was there a big rebellion? I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, um, but we will we will learn a little bit about the history there. Um, and then that question is an important one, that question about you know, can muggles like have wizard children mm-hmm. and all all of that? That's a huge theme throughout the entire series. Uh, and so you'll learn a lot more about that. Okay, chapter two is called Vanishing Glass. Yes, that was... That was a good one. I liked that one. So in this chapter, we meet a slightly older Harry. He's about 10 years old. Well, he is 10 years old, I guess. And he is sleeping in the cupboard under the stairs in the Dursley's house. And we meet uh, an older Dudley. I guess we meet Dudley for the first time. Uh, and, uh, And it's his birthday and he has a lot of presents and he's kind of obnoxious. And Harry has to cook the bacon. And then... Eventually, they go to the zoo. Yeah, that whole ordeal of how Harry got to the zoo was very upsetting. Why? Well, just that they're treating him so badly. Yeah, over Um, the top bad. So, yeah, just blatantly awful. Um, Yeah, it just makes me sad. Also, does cupboard have a different meaning in England? Because, like, cupboard to me is like a cabinet that you put dishes in. Does it mean more like closet? It's like a closet. Yeah, it's like okay. a little, it's a tight, tiny closet. And, but like, it still evokes a similar image in your head. Like cupboard, mm-hmm. you think of a really tiny cabinet and like, that's fair. Okay. Like he's living in a really tight, horrible space for a child to be living in. And they even talk about like spiders falling from the ceilings at some point. And yeah. So, yeah. So it is, it's not a place that you would want to sleep. Yeah. I I liked the description of his hair growing no matter what they did, like growing mm-hmm. in every different direction and um, being untamable. And I wondered if there are other like physical anomalies in wizards. Like, is that a common thing? Like, does everyone have like something that kind of defies physics? I think, well... It depends. Some do, some don't. But I think that kind of whole description of of Harry with untamed hair, that's just like how he looks. And that's how later on you'll learn that his father looked very similar. But it's also supposed to kind of reinforce that he's a he's special. Right. And he's Mm -hmm. there's something going on with Harry that is not normal because they there was a lot of those stories actually where they would cut his hair and then the next day it would grow back like it hadn't been cut at all. Yeah, or like the sweater that kept shrinking every time she tried to put it on. Yeah, because it was an (laughs) ugly sweater that he didn't want to wear. Yeah. (laughs) And at one point, I think there's a story about Dudley and his gang chasing Harry around and all of a sudden Harry like ended up on the roof Mm -hmm. of the school. Uh, And so those, those are all stories that are supposed to emphasize that there's something strange going on here. He's not really a normal child Mm -hmm. um alluding to the fact that he's a wizard right 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 which i imagine the way that that the dursleys talk about wizards like they know they exist i mean obviously they have like family ties to it they have to kind of know what's going on right they're not yeah i mean they are idiots but (laughs) like they know what's up which is why they're going through all of this effort to keep him from it is what I imagine. Yeah. I think you're you're spot on. And that will come out in these next three chapters as well. Is you'll get the reveal about kind of what they know related to Harry. Because from the first chapter, we know that Dumbledore left a note. He he left mm-hmm. Harry on the doorstep and he left a, a letter with right. Harry. Um, we don't really know what that letter says, but presumably there's some information there about what the hell's going on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, 
<laughs> so then we go to the zoo and we meet the snake. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that whole interaction? This is all, by the way, this is very different from what you thought would happen with the snake. You knew the snake would be at the zoo, obviously, mm-hmm. but you thought the snake and the vanishing glass was like the entrance to yeah, the wizarding world. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I thought he was going to go through yeah through the the aquarium glass so to speak yeah um yeah that didn't happen but and i wonder if i'm like thinking too hard about this because that's very possible but the little interaction between the snake and harry i felt like there was kind of like they were drawing a line between the similarities of them like the snake is in this really small space. It's too small for him. He's not where he belongs. He's never even been to Brazil where he came from because he was like born in captivity. And then so I was like, well, is is that kind of like a metaphor for Harry trapped in this cupboard, trapped on regular earth, non-magic <laughs> yeah. earth? I think, um, I think that's very clearly a metaphor for Harry's life. Okay. Well, but then I wasn't yeah, thinking I mean, too hard good, about no, it. No, don't think too hard about it. Um, but I think there's a couple of weird things that happen here. First off, Harry is talking to this snake, right? Mm-hmm. And the snake acknowledges him and doesn't talk back, but he like can gesture towards things like he gestures, gestures towards the sign that says he's from Brazil and raised in captivity. And he like nods a couple of times. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it's revealed that the snake can understand Harry mm-hmm. and also the glass to the case vanishes mm-hmm. like the title of the chapter. So those are kind of like the two shocking moments in this chapter. Well, and then the snake gets out, right? The snake does get to like yeah. leave and be free. Yeah. The snake gets out and like snaps at the heels of some like playfully snaps, I think. Yeah. At some people as it slithers. I hope away. that snake's having a good time. Yeah, me too. I think everyone does. Hopefully he made it to Brazil. It probably didn't. He probably <laughs> quickly got caught by zoo no, staff. No, no, no. And put no, back no. in that exhibit. He's free. He's free. <laughs> Working in an aquarium. <laughs> I can tell you he probably didn't make it to Brazil. Okay. I'm sorry. Maybe someone took him there. Maybe someone like felt bad for him and was like, I'm going to take him. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we can think about that. Okay. And that was basically chapter two. Not, yeah. a, lot, not a lot of crazy stuff yeah, happened. Yeah, not a lot of crazy. I think chapter three was the most interesting to me. Why? Um, I just liked how... They're like literally going to the ends of the earth to avoid this letter yeah. coming from Harry. Um, so a letter arrives for Harry that's mm-hmm. like addressed to Harry specifically. It even says cupboard under the stairs. Right. Which is why then they're like, oh, we'll move him. We'll give him his own room. Um, and then they just keep on going further and further and further out. Uh, which it was nice to kind of finally see the parents not giving into everything Dudley wanted. Like they were like telling him to shut up too and he wasn't getting his way. Exactly. And, and yeah. So like I felt like the playing field was evened just a tiny, tiny bit, even though it's so rude not to give Harry his letter. Also, how did the letter get there without a stamp? This is a question I have. <laughs> yeah, they don't address that. <laughs> they do say that like letters fly in through the fireplace. Yeah. So you can't you can't mail letters without a stamp. This is something I know. Mm-hmm. And now I'm wondering, okay, so both of my parents are postal workers. Maybe that's why they didn't let me read Harry Potter. Because <laughs> Because letters were <laughs> delivered without a stamp. Yeah, maybe they and read. And that's not possible. Yeah, maybe they read the first couple, like the first section, and they were like, oh, no. This puts postal workers this is in a bad light. Propaganda. No way. <laughs> we're not going to let you read this story. Letters without stamps? It couldn't couldn't be more got, evil. That has to be it. <laughs> oh, That's probably gosh. it. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, um, so. 
so they he gets this letter and then they don't let him read it and the the Dursleys like Vernon and Dudley uh, Vernon and uh, Mrs. Dursley Petunia read it mm-hmm. and they they clearly kind of know what's going on. It's mm-hmm. like they it shocks them, but they also kind of know what's going on. So they don't let him read any of the letters that come for him. And so that also kind of speaks to when you were saying, do they kind of know what's going on? What do, are mm-hmm. they aware? Um, I think clearly they're a little aware that um, that what's going on with Harry or, or that something potentially is happening with Harry, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did find that entertaining because they go, they move him to the room and then he tries to go get the mail, but Mr. Dursley is like sleeping on the doormat. And then they go to a hotel and it finds them there. Mm -hmm. And each time it's like more and more. It's like exponentially more. And each time the address on the letter changes. Yes, to wherever they are. Yeah. Yeah. And so then finally they get out to this abandoned shack in the middle of the sea, um, which like I just have to assume Mrs. Dursley and Dudley just think that he's gone crazy taking them out in the middle of this storm. Um, And then it was really sweet and kind of sad watching, not watching, but reading, (laughs) um, watching in my brain, uh, Harry kind of count down to his own birthday. (laughs) I was just going to say that that's like the saddest part for me (laughs) is when he's like alone on the floor. But I kind of love it. I mean, can you you, relate to that? Well, I don't know so much about that, but I did used to play orphan a lot because I really wanted to be an orphan <laughs> when I was little. Yeah, this is the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't think it's that sad. I think you think it's sad. It's sad. But you had a good childhood, so that's different. <laughs> um, I just thought it was so fun to pretend to be an orphan. So whenever Harry, sat, sad little boy, is sitting there like watching the, the minutes tick and he's by himself, I don't know. I thought that was really sweet. And yeah, special. I think that's the saddest part for me <laughs> because he's alone on a cold like floor in a shack in the middle of the ocean and he doesn't even have like a blanket. He's using like his jacket or something and he's counting down. Yeah, but we the know seconds. he's going to get out of this. Like we know he's It's still sad. Okay, okay, but <laughs> we know there's going to be some redeeming storyline for him but yeah and then we hear this shaking and um bumping in the night and do we actually see that it's hagrid no i think i spoiled that for you yeah how dare you i thought that we did yeah i I think we we, i think we kind of know here i don't know i think i totally spoiled that let me see let me see i have the book right here live fact check i think it just ends with there was someone at the door Right. Boom. The whole shack shivered and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside knocking to come in. Yeah. So we don't know. Okay. So I spoiled it for you. I'm sorry. I think I knew either way, though, just because of the description of Hagrid before. But anyway. Okay. Well, I spoiled that. I apologize. But uh, yeah, and that's how the chapter ends with this banging at the door right when he turns 11. I know. What a cliffhanger. Yeah. What could happen next? Mm. Well, you're going to tell me in just a minute. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple broad questions just about the story. Um, did you like the first three chapters overall? I did. I enjoyed the more like clever and comical elements to them. Was it different than your expectations going into the story? A little bit. Yeah. I think because of the level it's written on, like the reading level it's written on, it reminds me of uh, the Roald Dahl books that I loved as a kid, the BFG mm-hmm. and James and the Giant Peach. And um, it reminded me a lot more of that than I was anticipating. Um, just like clever, sweet descriptions and setting up like kind of world building setting up this kind of world that's a little bit different from the one that we know and through a child's eyes and like I don't know that was that was more interesting than I anticipated what didn't you like about the first three chapters um 
I mean, I mentioned some of the things already. Like I didn't like that some of the descriptions of people were just that they were fat. <laughs> um, you didn't like the over the top kind of caricature yeah, descriptions. I I didn't love just how awful his aunt and uncle were to him. And that knowing that, that the, you know, big wig magicians left him there for the first 11 years of his life. I know they were trying to protect him and they were like, oh, like he's going to get a big head if he grows up. Everyone's going to know who he is. But like there's ways like there's some, you know, children of celebrities that don't have to be put through that. So I understand why he grew up in such an awful place and that it's this big juxtaposition to Hogwarts. Um, but it is a little bit over the top for my taste. My last just kind of general question is, was there anything that really like surprised you at all? I mean, I, th I think I was surprised that we spent a whole chapter without Harry in it that we spent so much time with just the Dursleys. Mm -hmm. I'm also a little surprised, and maybe they address this later, but if if the Dursleys hated him that much, why wouldn't they just want to send him off to this boarding school? Good question. Like, wouldn't they just want him out of their lives? Good question. Okay. We'll learn about that in the next section. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Which takes us to the next part <laughs> Of the podcast where Becky is going to make a prediction about what happens in the next three chapters. I'm just going to go over the rules for her predictions. So I'm going to give her some information to base these predictions on. The first thing I'm going to give her are the chapter names. So she will know what the chapters are called and that will give her some information. I'm also going to give her the major characters in this section of chapters. So across the three chapters, what are the major characters that play a significant role? Uh, and then I'm going to give her the major locations. So all of the main places that are important in the story. Now, I just want to be clear that we're getting into like the actual meat of the story here. This is... I'm a vegetarian. Okay, you don't have to eat it. Just read it. <laughs> We're, we're getting into the potatoes of the story. We're getting into the potatoes of the story here. There's going to be a lot of characters, a lot of places. You're going to be introduced to a whole lot of stuff here. So this one is a doozy. And I think this one is going to be the biggest one of the entire story. Uh, because these next three chapters are pretty important. So just be aware that this is going to be a lot. I hope you can handle it. So the chapters are chapter four, five, and six. Chapter four is called The Keeper of the Keys. Chapter five is called Diagon Alley. And chapter six is called The Journey from Platform Nine and Three Quarters. Within that, those sections of chapters, within this section, here are the major characters. First, there's the Dursleys. There's Harry Potter. There's Rubius Hagrid, Professor Quirrell, Griphook, Draco Malfoy, Hedwig, Mr. Ollivander, Mrs. Weasley, Fred and George Weasley, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, and Crab and Goyle. These are all characters that play some important or significant role in these three chapters. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of them. Um, so just do your best with your prediction but it's it, and try to incorporate all of them. But uh, I understand if you don't get everything right. All right, let me do the major locations now. So the major locations are the Leaky Cauldron, Diagon Alley, Gringotts, Madame Malkin's Robes for All Occasions, Ollivanders, Platform Nine and Three Quarters, and the Hogwarts Express. So a lot's going on here. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot more than last time. It's a lot more than last time. Okay. But do your best. All right. All right.
All right, there's a lot to get through here, so I'm going to try to go pretty quickly and cover all of these characters and locations. All right, so you kind of gave it away that at the end of Chapter 3, the visitor who's booming outside the shack is Hagrid, which I think I already knew. But um, So Hagrid shows up at the abandoned shack and essentially kidnaps Harry Ooh. while the Dursleys are asleep. So he takes them into the night, and they go to the Leaky Cauldron, which... For sure sounds like a bar, but he's a kid. So maybe it's a restaurant. Uh, they go to the Leaky Cauldron. And uh, Harry finally gets to eat like a proper meal. And I'm sure there's like a big deal about how like yummy it is and how he's never had so much food in his life because he was abused. Um, all right. So then they are going to head on their way to Diagon Alley, which I used to think was Dragon Alley because there's a big dragon <laughs> in Harry Potter world. Yeah. And I went there, so I thought they were everybody was saying Dragon Alley. I remember the one thing you told me about <laughs> you going was you didn't know about the bank. You didn't know what, why a bank was special. Yeah. And then th for some reason there was a dragon on the bank. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a dragon. It's not Dragon the, Alley. It's Diagon Alley. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I think that's the place that I've been to. I think that's kind of what the little setup at Harry Potter World, the little village I called it. I think that is supposed to be Diagon Alley. Okay. So they go there, and it's like a little, you know, village quaint shopping center, and they have to get all this stuff for Harry to go to school. So they run into two people, or two wizards, rather, that Hagrid knows, Professor Quirrell and Griphook. And I think this is going to be the first time that Harry is faced with kind of like the lore about him. Uh, I, I feel like these adult wizards are going to have like some reaction that's like, oh, is this the boy we've been hearing about for so long? And Harry's going to be like, why have they been hearing about me? Um, but I feel like that interaction is going to be really brief and they're going to move on. And then they head to Gringotts, which I think is the bank that I was confused about mm -hmm. uh, in Harry Potter world. Um, so they go there. Maybe they're getting Harry set up with like his bank account or getting something in order. Oh, but I do remember in the ride, it kind of like went down to the bowels of the bank. So maybe... That's part of it. Like they have to go retrieve something. I don't know. Maybe there's like a safety deposit box or something with something for Harry. So they go to the bank and they get something for Harry. Yeah. Maybe it's something from his parents, like an inheritance that he didn't have access to or something of sentimental value. Mm -hmm. It's got to be kind of a big deal if they like centered a whole ride around it at Harry Potter world. Hmm. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. I'm not me. Apparently. Mm -hmm, definitely <laughs> not you. So, um, okay. After the bank, uh, they go to this Madam Malkin. Is that what it says? Yeah. Madam Malkin's. Madam Malkin's robes for all occasions. So I think he has to get his wizard robe. So they do the whole, like, fitting thing, and they pick out the right robe. Um, maybe there's a fun, like, montage of him trying on all these robes that aren't right, you know? Book montage. A, bo a good book montage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this one is too green, and this one <laughs> is, yeah, I don't know. So he gets his new fit for Hogwarts, and then Ollivander's... Sounds like the wand place, maybe. He has to get his wand for school. Um, I I believe there's, like, some big process in picking out the wand. Um, just from what you've told me 
and what other people have told me about the whole wand Mm -hmm. experience at Harry Potter World. Um, So I don't know what that is. Did you see that when you went to Harry Potter World? No. Okay. I did not. Great. Mr. Ollivander, I think, is the wand guy. They go through the process. And then Hagrid's like, okay, okay, we got to get going. They got to go to platform nine and three quarters or 9.75, like I like to call it. Yeah. And... (laughs) That's that's what you'd prefer to call it. Yes. They go to platform 9.75, uh, which is at the train station. Um, and I think he's going to then meet his classmates, which I know like Hermione and the Weasleys. And I think this Draco or Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. Yeah. I think he, you know, obviously other kids are on their way to Hogwarts as well. So I think he's going to run into them. This is going to be kind of like his tribe, his gang. So they get onto the Hogwarts Express, getting to know each other a little bit. Um, And then Crab and Ghoul. I I don't know. I, I think they sound like creatures to me. Like they sound like goblins or like trolls. Um, so I'm going to guess that they are like the, the train captains or engineers that goblins run the train to goblins Hogwarts the train. <laughs> and these are the two. I like that. Crab and ghoul. It kind of sounds like a, an Abbott and Costello kind of combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> crab and ghoul. Crab and ghoul. At it again. Um, yeah. So then. Just we, to let you know, it's pronounced yeah. Goyle. Goyle? Goyle. Like she was the prettiest Goyle in the whole world? Exactly like that. (laughs) Awesome. Crab and Goyle. Even better. Okay, wait. Who do you think, of all these people listed, who do you think is Harry's best friends? I mean, I know... I know that Hermione and one of the Weasleys, I'm going to guess, well, because of the way you have it, structured i'm gonna guess ron ron and hermione weasley i know there's always like a trio because i've seen memes Mm -hmm. with like why is it always probably knew that like yeah like why is it always you three and it's like texas florida and california or whatever Mm. classic meme yeah um did you did you talk about hedwig did i miss that uh no they meet hedwig (laughs) They go to a wig shop. Oh. To deal with his hair. <laughs> and there's a person there named Hedwig? Yeah, Hedwig okay. owns the wig That's, shop. They own the wig shop. Yeah. Right. So when they're in Diagon Alley mm-hmm. and he's going around to all these places, mm-hmm. an additional place he goes to is the wig shop. I guess it's, I want to revise that. Why would he go to a wig shop? I want to revise it. Okay. I think Hedwig is a barber. Okay. And can finally magically cut his hair. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. So then we end with Harry Potter and his new best friends catching a glimpse of the Hogwarts castle in the distance from the train window. And that's how we end chapter six of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. (laughs) Thank you for that prediction, Becky. I just want to let everyone know that I have not given Becky any insider information whatsoever, except for the fact that I spoiled that Hagrid knocked on the door. But she's going into completely like unknown territory here. She really has no idea what's going on. What we're going to do now is go and read those three chapters of the book, and then we're going to come back in next episode. We'll talk about how right or wrong Becky was. We'll have a deep discussion on those chapters, and then Becky will make her next prediction for the next section. If you want to stay informed with what's going on with this podcast, we have an Instagram account where we post funny pictures and random things and thoughts and show what's going on behind the scenes. We also have a Twitter account where Becky posts very random, nonsensical Hogwarts facts that just fall out of her brain randomly. So go check those out. That's, I believe, at Muggles Guide on Twitter and then Muggles Guide Podcast on Instagram. Uh, So go check them out. They're also in the show notes for the podcast. 
Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.